Hello, and welcome today to Protective Strategies, another great webcast from Schwab Coaching. My name is Ben Watson. I'm an education coach and senior manager here at Charles Schwab. I'm joined out there in the chat today by none other than the Cameron May, another great instructor and education coach, 20 plus year veteran in the financial markets. My thanks to Cameron for helping to answer the questions. Thanks to all of you for joining us, because if you've ever asked the question, oh, it's earnings day for the stock that I might have a position on, is there anything I can do to mitigate some of that potential risk? Then you might be in the right place. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today as we discuss protective strategies. As we get started doing that, a couple of quick reminders from a housekeeping perspective. Remember that everything we talk about simply for illustrative and educational purposes only doesn't constitute any kind of a recommendation or suggestion or endorsement of any particular security chart pattern, strategy, or anything else. We're gonna talk options today. Since we're talking about protective strategies, remember that options are not suitable for all investors. There are special risks associated with trading options that make sure that make it uh, potential to lose money in those strategies. Make sure that you understand the characteristics and risks of standardized options before you trade options or any of these strategies that we talk about. Remember that Schwab doesn't recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of investment research. Now, the paper money platform is for educational purposes only. It does not guarantee future success out there in the real world. And since we're talking about short options today in part of this discussion, remember that short options could be assigned early anytime, regardless of where they are, in the money, at the money, out of the money, it doesn't matter. There's the potential for those short options to be assigned early. The paper money platform does not facilitate the early assignment of short options. So that's a difference if you're moving from paper money trading to live trading. Now we're gonna use today, and this is a special treat, we're gonna use both the Thinkorswim desktop software platform, as well as I'm gonna show you how to put this, uh, some of these strategies together on the Thinkorswim web-based platform as well. But remember that any of the uh, examples that we use are for illustrative purposes. Remember that investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. Probability analysis is theoretical. Stop loss orders will not guarantee an execution at a specific price. Make sure that you're aware of the risks of, of stop orders. And remember that if we talk about futures or futures contracts, futures trading requires separate trading authorization. It has substantial risk. It is not suitable for all investors. Now, as we jump into this discussion, lots of great folks out there in the chat. I'm noticing some familiar names here, uh, Dave and Lakshmi and Alfred and Kevin and Ken and a few others. Welcome to all of you. My good friend Cameron May is out there in the chat. By the way, if you want to follow me, you can follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Ben Watson CS. You can follow Cameron at Cameron May CS. And all of the other coaches follow a very similar naming convention. The other thing that I'm going to ask you to do is we're making this slight transition here from getting started with those housekeeping items to our agenda today is simply this. If you have not already done so, click on that subscribe button down at the bottom of the page. That subscribe button is going to keep you connected to the Trader Talks webcast channel and to the community that's going on here that's going to give you alerts if you turn on that notification that will allow you to know when we're going live with webcasts, when we've posted new archives, all kinds of great benefits. And it, it, is, it is at no cost to you to click on that subscribe button. Only do it if you haven't already done so before. We don't want you to unsubscribe and get lost, but subscribe if you have not already. So as we jump into this discussion, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the idea of callers in general. We, it's one of the protective strategies that we discuss in this particular webcast on an ongoing basis. But I have a, a particular idea in mind, and that is a caller strategy around an earnings announcement. Now we are at the tail end of earnings season. And at the tail end of earnings season, there's not a lot left, but there are a couple of earnings announcements that may create a bit of market volatility. And we'll talk about one of those uh, along the way. Now, again, that quick reminder that anything that we discuss, any individual symbol, 
simply for illustrative and educational purposes only. And it is no way, shape, or form any kind of a recommendation. But we're going to talk a bit about what protective strategies are, how to put those protective strategies on, some of the characteristics of those strategies. We're going to look at examples on the platform. And as I promised, we're going to look at putting together a caller example on both the Thinkorswim desktop software platform as well as the Thinkorswim web-based platform. For those of you that are using or are curious or have used or maybe occasionally use the Thinkorswim web-based platform, today is a great day for you to be here as well because we're going to uh, illuminate that uh, side of the application just a little bit as well. And again, go ahead and ask those questions to Cameron out there in the chat. So let's talk really quickly about what a caller is. And caller is, is just a simple strategy name for a combination trade. And it's a combination of selling a call option, much like a covered call, but it re requires, again, like a covered call does, the ownership of the underlying stock. The reason that we sell a covered call is to bring in some capital to help offset the cost of buying a put option. Now, the protection in a caller strategy really comes primarily from the purchase of the put option to provide an offset to that downside movement, number one, or to provide a specific and precise exit point if you were to choose to exercise the right that the put option gives you. Now, I've talked about that in previous webcasts in this series about using uh, a protective put as a precise exit as opposed to using a stop order as an imprecise or kind of big rough raw hammer type of exit. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we get into this discussion as well, but that's the strategy, selling a call option, buying a put option at the same time and creating that uh, protection against downside movement potentially. So now that being said, let's take a look at what we're where we're headed today uh, in this discussion. I'm gonna jump out here to the Thinkorswim desktop software platform first. Now we're a little bit under an hour to go until the market closes. And the, the market has been moving in somewhat of a downward direction here. The SPX certainly has been moving in a little bit of a downward direction. In fact, breaking below that uh, diagonal trend line, which is roughly the 20 period simple moving average, where I'm a little bit maybe more concerned is what's going on in the NASDAQ today. A little bit more downside movement in the RSI, pushing prices down. A little bit more of a move to the downside in the NASDAQ, almost down to the 50 period moving average. Now, that being said, still in a bullish uptrend, right? Despite this little bit of a pullback, we can still argue that the NASDAQ still making higher highs and higher lows at, least at this point. Now, <laughs> And Helen, I totally understand that. Um, and then totally understand the concept of, of maybe becoming a bit fatigued about hearing the same stocks, maybe the Magnificent Seven or whatever it might be that have been driving the market. But if you look at the holdings and the percentage of holdings in uh, a particular index, um, that's where you have to kind of go to that perspective and say, hey, you know what? Those stocks, those... Uh, stocks that represent a significantly large component of a particular market or a particular index, uh, there's a reason that people are paying attention to them. And, uh, and so that's where we're going to go. Now, before we get there, before we get to that part of the discussion, I want to do one other thing. I want to pop over here to the monitor tab really quickly. And I want to take a look at a position currently that we have a caller on, and that is Costco. So I'm going to pop to the charts really quickly and I'm gonna change my grid to my single grid, just a typical uh, one year, one day chart. And uh, we're gonna take a look at Costco, C-O-S-T. We can see that Costco post earnings has been moving pretty much in a bullish upward direction. Implied volatility generally has been climbing along with the rest of the market. And if we come back over here to our monitor tab, we can see that the position that we have on Costco, which is 100 shares of the stock and a long put option at the 640 strike 
and a short call option at the 665 strike presents us with a little bit of a challenge here, right? That challenge is this. Our long put option that was intended to provide protection has done its job. We've lost some money in that put, but simply because the price of the stock has continued to move higher. Now, what maybe is a little bit more concerning is the fact that the short call option that we sold originally at the 665 strike has now been blown through. The stock's currently trading at 720. So if this were live, if this were a live trading account and paper money didn't uh, or, or allowed for that, uh, that early assignment of short options, it's very likely that we would have been assigned early the obligation to deliver the shares of stock at 60, 665 when it's currently trading at 720. So we're kind of whistling past the graveyard here with the paper money platform in that it doesn't facilitate that early assignment because this option is pretty deep in the money, that 665. If we were in a live trading account, like I said, very likely that that option would have been assigned early and we would have had to uh, satisfy that obligation by delivering shares, the 100 shares of stock that we own. Now that might be okay because we're still, you know, up on the trade. We bought stock at 564, and if we were to deliver it at five at 665, that's a pretty good move to the upside that we've taken advantage of there. But at the same time, the stock's currently trading at 720. Now, if we wanted to eliminate that obligation, because we created a caller, we bought the put option, we sold the call option, the stock moved. In order to eliminate that obligation, we'd have to buy back this short call option for $57.20 per share. Pretty significant increase that we're gonna have to uh that we're gonna have to pony up out of pocket to close down that trade and eliminate that obligation. That's the risk in creating a covered call uh and having the stock make a big move. Now the reason I bring this up first is because this becomes an issue. Right When you have an earnings announcement, there is the potential for stock to make a big move. And sometimes it can eclipse your short call as it has done in this particular circumstance. So what do we do now? With nine days to go until expiration, if we were to simply let this go to, through till expiration, it's likely, not 100%, but likely that that short call at the 665 strike would be assigned. We'd have to deliver the shares at 564 and our put option would expire worthless. Now, WC brings up a good point. We could roll this, and that's kind of where we're getting to in this scenario. Now, if we were to roll straight out, if we were to roll straight out to the next expiration of the 665, that buys us a little bit of time. It kicks the can down the road, but it doesn't get us out of the scenario because the price of the stock would have to come back below to or below that 665 in order for us to see that scenario where we could just exit and not have to buy back that obligation. So what we could potentially do here is roll not only out time-wise, so not only moving out time-wise, but out and up. So creating kind of a diagonal roll, if you will. So let's examine that here really quickly. Now, one thing to keep in mind, rolling is not a guarantee that you're gonna have a liquid market in the contracts that you are rolling to, number one. Number two, rolling isn't a magic wand, and it does not automatically or magically get rid of transaction costs or anything else. It's simply a matter of being able to put this order together in a convenient fashion and make that roll or, or accomplish that, in this case, buying back the one that we sold and selling another one in one transaction, if you will. Doesn't take away transaction fees, it's not a magic wand or anything else. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click and we're gonna create a rolling order. And that rolling order by default is gonna be simply a straight out calendar roll month to month or expiration to expiration. So it's gonna look for the next expiration at the same strike. And if we click on that, you can see what that roll looks like. It rolls us to the uh, eight March expiration at the 665 strike. And that 665 strike, still puts us in the same scenario. We're still deep in the money in this particular case. We're able to roll it for a credit. Now, generally my thought process is this, especially if I'm rolling short options, I wanna roll for a credit or I just wanna forget it. But this might not be one of those situations where 
rolling for a credit is possible because what we're going to do is we're going to roll out even a little bit more in time. So we're going to give ourselves a little bit more time. I'm going to roll out to the 15 March expiration and I'm going to roll up in strike price, right? So I'm going to roll perhaps if I can roll maybe up to the 700 strike. Now, the reason for that is I'm working our way, working the way closer where the price of the stock is currently trading. And the price of the stock currently trading, if we take a look up here, COST, Costco, price of the stock currently trading at $7 or $720. Now, this is going to cost us, right? We're going to have to put money in to move that roll. But that money that we're putting in is going to be less than, less than if we were to be called out and what we're giving away if the price of the stock were at 665, we were called out at 665, and now the stock's trading at 720. We've given up more than that. So we're sacrificing a little bit of potential gain to keep that uh, call option going. Now, the other thing that we could think about doing is just simply closing it down completely. But just for the sake of this demonstration, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna accomplish this roll it's gonna mean a little bit of cash out of pocket in this particular case. Now, how do you manage that? Well, you might think about now continuing to kind of gently roll if there are times when implied volatility is inflated and you can roll to an option that sells for an inflated price and you can bring in a little bit more extrinsic value or a little bit more credit for that extrinsic value. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on confirm and send. I'm gonna read through any alerts here recognizing that uh, this order is going to cost us out of pocket, but it's going to move us down the road time-wise, and it's going to move us up strike price-wise, allowing the stock a little bit. still in the money. We're rolling to an in-the-money option, but this is an opportunity to kind of accomplish that and maybe let the stock settle a little bit because it does have the potential to move. Maybe the stock settles a little bit. We can roll or we could look at buying back the option at a later date when time decay has eaten away the majority of that premium. But, but now what we're going to do is we're going to roll out a couple expirations. We're going to go ahead and click on send here after reading those alerts, and we'll see if we can accomplish that roll. Now, that's one way that we can manage this. The other thing that we could do is we could go back to that monitor tab, and we could look at selling back this put option. Although, here's the thing. We don't necessarily need to sell back this put option. It's likely that it will expire worthless um, given the fact that uh, the stock is well above, in fact, almost 100 points above where the strike price is on this stock. So it is far, far out of the money. But if you wanted to clean things up, we could right-click, create a closing order, and sell that put option back and get that off of the books. And again, reading the alerts, making sure that we're aware of anything, and going ahead and closing that out and eliminating that put option. But what that does is it takes away that protection. So we may think about at some point adding another put option in there to recreate that collar. And all we've done is really roll that collar kind of down the road a little bit. All right. But now let's get to the main event here and in terms of this discussion, NVDA. And the reason for this, and again, I think this is back to, to Helen's point, was the fact that, yeah, there are a lot of people talking about this. And the reason that there are a lot of people talking about this is because there are a lot of eyes on this. And the reason that um, there is so much attention going on here, uh, the stock has made a big run to the upside. It has been a major component of the NDX. And now we're coming up with an earning, earnings announcement at a time in which the price of the stock has made really the biggest downside move that it's made uh, since really the September timeframe of last year. And we've seen it move maybe back down into this level of support here, right around that 665 level or so. Now, that being said, we've got an earnings announcement coming up. And the reason that I bring up implied volatility is because we notice that oftentimes implied volatility rises ahead of earnings. And that can be a benefit to us, but it can also hurt us if we're going to try to create some sort of a collar or a hedge around this earnings announcement. Now, one thing you could do is you could simply say, I'm going to leave it unhedged around the earnings and maybe it doesn't make a move, right? Um, it could bounce and it could move higher. David says, or is it a flag? As a matter of fact, I talked a little bit about this in my bull or my uh, trading flag patterns webcast the other day. 
But uh, the idea here is maybe we get a bounce and a move to the upside. Maybe we get a move to the downside. As a matter of fact, if we come over to the trade tab for NVIDIA and we take a look at the current uh, market maker move, the current market maker move, which is how the market is pricing the expectation for price movement in the underlying stock is about 65 bucks plus or minus, right? Up or down. And in fact, if we were to go to the February uh, 23rd expiration options, which expire in two days, that plus or minus move is $68 plus or minus. This is a stock that can certainly make a $65 move in one or two days. What I'm gonna look at here in this particular case in providing potentially some risk mitigation using a protective strategy is looking at creating a collar short term, right? Short term. Now the balance always in trading, since we've got a long option component, that long option component is the driver of this trade for the most part. The trade-off that we have is theta decay versus the amount of premium uh, and the length of time that we're in the trade. So it, it, these one March expiration options with nine days to go until expiration still have about 94% implied volatility, about an $80 plus or minus implied move. So think about it, these are still relatively inflated, but we're not looking to necessarily hold on to this collar much beyond this very short term where it's likely a lot of that movement is going to be realized. Could we create one a little bit further out? Yes, but the benefit of doing this when implied volatility is inflated is that we can sell the call option further out away from the at the money strike price, take advantage of that inflated implied volatility and, and use that to offset the cost of the put option to provide protection. Now watch this. If we go to the option chain and I look at the delta here, right? And I look at intrinsic and extrinsic. I start to look out of the money here and you notice how much extrinsic value I have now way out of the money here. If we go out here to say, for instance, the 25 delta strike, which is uh, about a 25% chance of being in the money, about a 75% chance of being out of the money. So that's three quarters, one quarter, one quarter chance that it could be in the money, three quarters chance that it's gonna be out of the money. Again, probabilities are theoretical, right? Probabilities are theoretical. But if I were to go out to the 740 strike, I still am selling about $14 of extrinsic value, which could be crushed pretty quickly if implied volatility goes down. And that's okay, because in selling this option, that's what we wanna do. Sell that implied volatility, that in elevated implied volatility, and then have it crushed so that if we need to buy that back, we can do that and allow the stock to continue to run. But think about this, we're at 666 roughly on the price of the stock, and our strike price is at 740. So if, is there the possibility that the stock could move seven to, to 740 yeah so so we're at 670 so that's 30 plus 40 so that's about what uh 60 70 points to the upside that this could move is it possible that this could move and put this option in the money yes it certainly is so we've got to be aware of that fact but i'll tell you what if we own the stock which we do at 600 and we get called out at 740 are we okay with that Probably so. And that's one of the questions, to be fair, that we probably ought to be asking in this strategy anyway, before we sell a covered call, because that's what we're doing. Am I okay giving up the stock at the strike price that I'm selling? And in this particular case, bought the stock at 600, selling it at 740, and I bring in a $14 premium, I'm okay with that. Now we're gonna use that $14, uh, that $14 premium roughly that we're going to bring in. So here's how we're going to create this. I'm going to hold my control key down. I'm going to sell the uh, 740 strike. I'm going to create an order to sell that 740 strike. And I'm going to bring in $14.20, $14 of 13, 30 cents of 
premium. But what I'm also going to do then at that point is I'm going to come back down here and I'm going to say, hey, where do I want to create some protection for the stock moving to the downside if it does, which it very well could. So I'm gonna go back to the chart really quickly and kind of cross check this and say, look, I've got a level of support right there at about 663. I've got another level of support down here at about 630. I've got a level of support here right around the 600 mark, which is where I bought the stock to begin with. Maybe even about 605, right? About 605. So if we were to let the stock come down to that point, now our protection takes over at that particular point. That's one way that we could go about selecting the strike for our put option. But you know what? There's another way that we could do that as well. I'm going to go back to my trade tab. I know that I'm selling. If I pop up my order box down here at the bottom, I'm selling this option for about $14.35 of extrinsic value. So what if now I were to just look at my my option price in this particular case or extrinsic value and say, let me choose a strike price that is equal to or that, that has extrinsic value equal to or less than what I'm bringing in for the covered call. Okay, so that puts me right here at about the 615 strike. So let's just cross check that against the chart. Here's 615. That's kind of right in this area of support. So if it were to break through that, that's where protection starts to take over because that option is going to start to gain intrinsic value at that point. So if I go to the trade tab and I look at, I'm going to hold my control key down. I'm going to look now at buying the 615 strike and I'm doing that for about a 20 cent credit. So remember the, the, the point of a hedge, or the point of a protective strategy is not to generate income, it is to provide protection. So the idea here is if price goes down, that protection intrinsic value wise is gonna start kicking in at the 615 strike. And if the price of the stock goes up to 740 and I get called out 740, okay, cool. I made a profit on the trade. I sacrificed a little bit um, because if it goes higher, then it's that's somebody else's money, right? But that's okay because this is a pretty substantial move to the upside. And I'm putting that protection on for the sake of, well, actually I'm in fact bringing in a little bit of a credit for putting this protection on. Now, before we do this, what I wanna do is I wanna right click and I wanna send this over to the Analyze tab. And I wanna go to the uh, risk profile of the Analyze tab. And I wanna kind of make this, so I've got 200 shares of the stock. So what I might do is put this on uh, put two contracts on just so that it's clear and it matches up with the number of shares of stock. I don't have to protect all 200 shares with the caller. I can protect 100. Now, that being said, and you're right. Thanks, Helen. I appreciate that. So let's squeeze this in a little bit and recognize, let's set our slices to the base price and two standard deviations. So if the price of the stock makes a move, two standard deviations, well, our protection is going to kick into the downside and we might get called away to the upside, but it's gonna make that two standard deviation move in order to get to those points. And here's the cool thing, watch what happens if implied volatility drops. Let's say implied volatility drops by 20%, minus 20% drop in implied volatility. That's actually gonna work in our favor in this trade because it's eating away at that premium of our short call option and allows us to buy it back. So if implied volatility crushes, that works in our favor. And uh, for checkout, you, you're absolutely right. For checkout makes a comment, you could put on two different collars. One collar, different strike prices at the at, at 400 shares and, and another collar, different strike prices, different expirations um, at uh, a different strike. You've got to be careful though. When you're doing two different collars at the same expiration that you don't create an embedded vertical spread, right? So something that we'll discuss in uh, a class going forward in one of our webcasts going forward. So I'm gonna go back over here to the trade tab and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna click on confirm and send. I'm gonna make that actually two contracts and I'm gonna go ahead and click on 
confirm, and send. We're going to read through the order, make sure that we're aware of any alerts, and we're going to go ahead and click on send. And we fired that off, and we actually brought in a credit of 65 cents, which tells me that implied volatility is rising a little bit as we get in here closer to the end of the day. We're not very far away from the end of the day. So that's an example of putting on a collar strategy ahead of an earnings announcement with a big implied volatility amount and expecting and creating that trade around where we expect the price of the stock to move based on, say, the market maker move or the implied price move based on implied volatility. Now, here's the thing that I promised you. This is the bamboo steamer. If you remember those old, um, those old uh, infomercials, now how much? Don't answer that. There is more. You're going to get the bamboo steamer. I'm going to show you the bamboo steamer here right now. So what we're going to do is I'm going to shift my focus really quickly. And by the way, while I'm doing this and making that this shift, this is a good opportunity for you to click on that subscribe button if you have not done so already. And, uh, and that way you can stay connected to this webcast. But for those of you who maybe aren't always sitting at your computer, um, your personal computer, Maybe you go to work and you can't download things to your computer at home or at work, or maybe you're on a shared computer at a, yes, but wait, there's more. Um, but maybe you're on a computer at a hotel or something like that, and you don't want to utilize the downloaded version of the Thinkorswim platform, you can do this. You can go to trade.thinkorswim.com, trade.thinkorswim.com, and you can open up the web-based version of the Thinkorswim platform. Now, the features are not the same. The functions are not all the same, but I went to trade.thinkorswim.com and this is what's gonna pop up, right? I'm not sharing the wrong screen. I'm showing you the login for this. And then you're going to click and log in just like you would do with the Thinkorswim platform. And then what it's gonna look like is it's gonna look like this, okay? This is what you're gonna see. This is the web-based version of the Thinkorswim platform. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to create that same order, that same call, uh, caller order here in the paper or in the web-based version of the Thinkorswim platform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to the top. I'm going to click in find a symbol and I'm going to type in NVDA, NVIDIA. And now I've got NVIDIA here in the center. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close down the left and the right sides so that I see the information about NVIDIA and I'm going to go to the option chain. Here's my option chain right here. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing that we did. I'm just going to show you how to build this in the web-based platform. So we're going to go to the expiration that's nine days to go from now. I'm going to open this up and you notice that once again, it's got calls on the left-hand side, puts on the right-hand side. Remember, we're gonna buy the, or we're gonna sell the call option at the 740 strike, and we're gonna buy the call option at the 615 strike. So we don't have those showing, so what we need to do is open this up by clicking here where it says strikes to more strikes. Well, there's our 615 strike, and here's our 740 strike. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this one leg at a time. You can't hold the control key down like you do in the Thinkorswim platform. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the bid price for the 740 and click on it. And it's going to bring up that first leg of my trade. Now, the cool thing is, since I already know that I'm going to buy the 615 strike, I can just click on option leg and add another leg here into my trade, I can change it to put option, and I can change the strike to that 615 strike just right here in the selector. And now I wanna make sure that I've got the right expiration date, March 1st. So those are the same expiration dates, selling the 740, buying the 615, selling the 740 call, buying the 615 put, and now I've created that combo order here in the web-based version of the paper money platform, I come over here and I'm doing it now for $1.87 credit because implied volatility is going up. Now, if I come back over here 
click on review. I can make sure that I'm aware of any alerts that exist here, walk through the order, read the order to make sure that it's what I want. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too hard to make that trade, right? And then I can go ahead and I can click on send and fire that order off. Now, since I already sent that order off for two contracts, I'm not going to send this one off because that would leave me with a naked call option on um, NVIDIA because I already placed it. Because remember, this is in the same account. And by the way, that's something cool that you can do. You can have the paper money platform open in the desktop software version, and you can also have the web-based platform open at the same time. So you can do two different things. Just make sure that if it's your live account, you're not placing two of the same trades and doubling up on a trade that you wanted to trade. So I would go ahead and click on send and fire that order off. And then it would show up here in my position statement for NVIDIA. I can open that up and I can see there's the trade that I've got right there. By the way, we've got some great webcasts. In fact, Cameron has done a couple of great webcasts talking about uh, using the uh, Thinkorswim web-based version and how you dig into all of the great features and functions of this web-based platform. So it's a lot of good stuff here. Um, so I would encourage you, if this is a platform that you want to try, start practicing with it, start playing with it. Oh, and you know what the cool thing is? If you've got somebody like one of the, the young people in your life and you want to get them started practicing, or your neighbor has been asking questions about, hey, what's that trading platform that you use? Here's something you can do. You can take them right here to trade.thinkorswim.com and you can click on create a guest pass and they can open up, they can open up a paper money account and start trading it using either the web-based or the desktop-based or the mobile-based mobile -based, um, for 30 days and uh, take advantage and get to know it and, and start to play with it. So create a guest pass, great way to get somebody you know involved in this and uh, not, not any kind of pyramid scheme in any way, shape or form. Just get them involved, share it with the young people in your life so that they get to learn about this as well. So some great, great stuff here. So let's do this. Now that we've got that, let's, uh, we know that that earnings announcement is gonna come up here in just a minute. Let's just kind of quickly review what we've done. We talked about caller strategies. We talked through that caller strategy. We looked at adjusting the caller strategy on uh, Costco by rolling it and closing down one side of it. We talked about various uh, scenarios. We put on an earnings driven protective strategy, that caller strategy on NVIDIA ahead of their earnings, which is coming up in just a few minutes from now. And we did it with a, an eye to the current implied volatility. We analyzed it. And then we looked at an example of how to place that trade, not only on the Thinkorswim desktop software platform, but also on the Thinkorswim web-based platform as well. Guys, great, great questions out here in the chat today. My thanks to Cameron May for helping to answer those questions. My thanks to all of you for being here. Click on subscribe if you haven't before. And if you would do me a favor really quickly, um, click on that like button down there at the bottom of the chat. That's going to not only do two things, it's going to help get this video out to more people, uh, but it's also going to kind of give us a sense of whether or not this is information is resonating with you and whether and what we can do to help to make these sessions better. So click on that like button. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed. Guys, thanks again for being here. My thanks to Cameron May and our great production staff. James Boyd's coming up uh, next with uh, trading growth and value stocks. Uh, and we will see you again here very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.